YouTube family. Welcome back or welcome to Recruiting Board. I'm Alex Agrawat, where I cover and promote football around New England. Take this time, like, share, and of course, subscribe to the best family here on YouTube. Especially because I'm only 3,000 subscribers away from passing Boston College. Let's do that. Like the video and comment somebody I should interview next. It helps with the algorithm. When your NFL career starts, I hear basically you get drafted and then business. It's all business. That's what that league is. It's big business. It's cutthroat business. You know, I came in and at the time, Charlie Batch, who had been a veteran and a first round draft pick of the Lions was there. And Tommy Maddox, who had like a career revival in Pittsburgh. He was a former first round pick of the Broncos back at the end of the Elway era. You know, I knew I had two veterans ahead of me. I knew the plan was just to take it slow with me. We ended up having a really bad year for Pittsburgh. I mean, we went 6-10. and 10. It was bad. They were in a unique position. They're not used to being in a 10th or 11th pick overall. And they drafted Ben Roethlisberger. And that was when you're a fifth round pick trying to make it in the league. And then they draft a top 10 guy over you. Your fate is kind of sealed. That was really hard for me. I, I didn't even, I had one year, did some good things in my rookie year, got a lot of positive feedback, and obviously it was a great decision for him, but it hurt my career, certainly. Unfortunately, I, not unfortunately, but I made the team the next year, which was great. I wanted to make the team. The years kept going on, and just not getting chances. They actually cut me at the end of my third year camp to try and bring me back in the following week, but they wanted to try and finagle a roster spot, so they, I made final cuts, then they cut me after final cuts just to try and do a one-for-one one roster-wise and then bring me back, and Baltimore picked me up. And I had to go. As a young guy, you don't have rights in terms of if they put a waiver claim in, yeah. you have to go. So I went, but what was unique was I went to Baltimore and I was on the practice squad for the first couple of weeks because that's just how they had to do it to make it work with the roster. And Ben gets hurt and Pittsburgh calls and wants me to come back, and I told him no. You told him no? I told him no because... Ozzie Newsom at the time at Baltimore said we're going to bring you up on the roster. And I lo saw more of a chance. I took him at his word, and he did. He brought me up on the roster. At the time, it was Kyle Bowler and Anthony Wright at quarterback depth chart versus a first-round pick. I came in with Kyle Bowler. He wasn't Ben Roethlisberger, and he struggled. Saw a potential chance there. So I stayed in Baltimore, and Pittsburgh was mad. Did the year there. Fast forward the following year, they signed Steve McNair from Houston, Baltimore. So now I'm like, oh, crap. So I go to camp, and in camp, Pittsburgh gets me back, which I was stunned. They wanted me back, so I re-signed with Pittsburgh. Spent two more years in Pittsburgh, and then I went to Arizona for two and finished up in Carolina. So if you can explain to me the day in the life of an NFL player. I know for the teams I wanted, it started early. A lot of times we had 6.30 workouts. You'd be in, you'd get breakfast, and then you'd be in meetings. 8.30 to 10, take a break, get back into meetings, then you'd eat lunch, get your treatment, whatever it is, and then you practice probably 1 to 3. 1 to 3.30, do some film after, and then you go home. So it's a regular work day. It's worked what it is. You just show up in your pajamas half the time, and you're wearing compression shorts and T-shirts, and you're living your dream. I, I just remember in Pittsburgh early being in stretch line and seeing the Steeler helmet in front of you, and just Jerome Bettis is right next to you, and Heinz Ward, Plaxico Burris, Antoine Randall, like guys that you were watching on TV, and like, damn, I'm here. Like, yeah. this is wild. There was a lot of good experiences about it. I mean, my NFL career was unfulfilling for me. I didn't play a lot, backup quarterback. But you have to take a take yourself back a little bit and be like, there's only 32 people in the whole world at any given time that are in those positions. Really, really hard to make it. And I was always on a team with a guy who's going to the Hall of Fame, Ben Roethlisberger, Steve McNair, and Kurt Warner. Yeah. You're not going to break in. <laughs> it's hard unless, I mean, look at Tom Brady. If Drew Bledsoe doesn't get hurt, who knows? Right. NFL's about opportunity, and it's just a, it was very, very hard for me to come by. But, you know, you did make it past those three years. Yeah, I know? mean, I, I played eight years. The average NFL career is two and a half. Two and a half, right. So I did all right. I earned everything I got there. I, I earned every team I made. I had to work really, really hard for it. And I, I take pride in that piece, and I kind of I, I feel like I've kind of brought that to our program here. You work for everything you get here. You will earn it and the best people will play. And I run the scout teams here because that's what I did in the NFL. I mean, you're the backup, you run scout team. You don't get real reps. The starter gets the real rep. So I take a lot of pride in that, and I put a lot of pride in those guys that I coach now that run scout team. Like, we're trying to kick the defense's butt or kick the offense's butt. And those guys really, 
they take to that, and I believe in that, and that's how you get better as a player. I know I got exponentially better. My second year in Pittsburgh, I was a backup for 10 weeks, and I took all the reps in scout team. And Bill Cowher came up to me and said, you need to treat this as your game every week. You're playing against the number one defense in the league yeah. every day in practice. And I took that to heart, and it got me so much better. When you're playing against Troy Palomalu, James Harrison, Joey Porter, James Farrier, like really, really good players. Dick LeBeau was the DC. So I'm getting to go against his defense in practice every day and picking his mind on, Coach, why do you do this? And he was so gracious with his time with me. I learned so much from him. Those kind of experiences, you can't put a price tag on. Dick LeBeau is one of the greatest defensive coordinators ever, and I got to spend four years with him. Go against his defense and kind of see how he saw the game, and I wouldn't trade that for anything. And, you know, obviously I know you and the people who know you. But, you know, you're not walking around thinking, you know, you're better than anybody or whatever. But what is that like when you are one? Because you do have to be a little bit guarded. You know, not everyone's your friend, yep. especially when you come up around here. Like, you're a professional athlete. You're seeing your boys. You're in the NFL. Yeah. What's, you know, what's that, what's that like? Well, around here it was tough because the Patriots had taken off, and I played for the Steelers, so I, I mean, <laughs> that makes you pretty unpopular pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I have my tight unit of friends and, and family, and I kept, kept to that. I keep a low profile. I'm not one of those guys that's out in front. My idea of a good time is in my backyard, taking care of the garden or cooking or just out with the fellows. I do like to work out, but I was pretty low profile kind of guy and just working. I spent most of my time working at my craft, trying to get better. And then just now being a father, that's really important to me. When you're Tom Brady, it's a little different. You got so many demands on your time and everyone wants a piece of you and all that. When you're a backup quarterback in the NFL, not so much. Locally, people know you. I mean, you're aware of that, but there was nothing about what I did football-wise that I didn't sign up for, and if you told me this is what's going to happen, I'd still do it 100 times over. If you want to talk about the process of getting cut, Coach, because I'm looking at your Wikipedia, right? So you were signed to the uh, Steelers on September 4, 2006. Two days later, he was moved to the practice squad, or the 53-man roster, yeah. and then you were cut on October 14th, yeah. and then re-signed two days later. And then cut again November 11th, and then re-signed two days later. So they were called roster manipulation. I didn't lose any money or anything. It was a way to, we had injuries, to get a guy off the practice squad for special teams reasons or because they needed him to now be a backup because the backup was now the starter. So sometimes they take they try to skate at quarterback position, and they just said, we got to do it for this game. You'll be back on Monday. No loss of pay or anything else. So I had to eat that. Financially, at least it didn't hurt me, which is important. But the pride piece and always having to have that conversation that year, that was a really tough year for me. It was very frustrating. But to his credit, Bill Cowell always kept his word. He's like, this is literally a manipulation for this game. I'm bringing you back on Monday. And he did. But it was hard. You mentioned, you know, Ben Roethlisberger, yeah. Kurt Warner, and then all the McNair, all these other guys, right? What's it like being in the room with them, though? Yeah, it was different. Like, Ben was young. He and I were 23 and 22 together. And so we were in our young 20s. And he wasn't much of a, a study guy. or He just kind of went in the room and, yeah, whatever. And he just made plays, like Nate plays. <laughs> Where Kurt Warner was at the end. He was in his late 30s when I was with him. He was running our offensive meetings. Wow. No, he ran up. Like, the OC was there. But Kurt would be like, all right, Fitz. Larry Fitzgerald, Anquan Bolden, like, here's what we're doing on this. You know, Steve Breston, I need you to do this. And, like, so it was it was his offense. It was in the language of the Cardinals, whatever they wanted, but it was the Mike Martz offense from the Rams, greatest show on turf, was what we were doing in Arizona. They couldn't have been two different situations. Then Steve McNair was just a country boy. Down-to-earth country dude that, let's play football, let's go have a couple beers, go fishing. That's what he was. Were you friends with him? I mean, not, I wouldn't say I was friends. I spent a year with him. You could just see how guys were with him and the interactions I had with him. Just such an easy guy to get along with and tough. Oh, my God, was he tough. 